Well, more than four decades ago, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, said that our country was on the road to revolution. Well, do you think things have gotten any better since then? And that's what we'll have to think about today as we continue to make our way through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus as we set off for 2 Kings chapter 21. But before we dig right into God's Word, let's take a minute and welcome Through the Bible's president, Greg Harris, who's here to update us on Through the Bible's online ministry. So hi, Greg. Welcome. Thanks, Steve. Good to be here. And you've got some good news to share with us about a relevant and easy ministry opportunity, don't you? I always have good news to share, Steve. It's There's so much good news in this ministry, uh, and that's why you keep inviting me back, right? That's one yeah. of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we want to talk, as you said, about our online ministry. You think about the old days when it was so hard to access programs. You either had the radio or perhaps this huge pile of cassette tapes. Right. Now we can offer it in so many different ways digitally, and, and today we just want to kind of hone in on one of those many ways we offer our content digitally, and that is a special website that's called ttbinmylanguage.com, and as its name implies, it is through the Bible in a language that most people on earth can understand. In fact, as we're recording today, we are at 99 languages available through that website. Which is pretty good, given that we've got right around 120 languages total. That is correct, and also when you realize that every single language is what we call language contextualized, not just the speech, but the writing. So that, so that if you speak, say, Hindi, then you're going to see the Hindi written script along right. with that. If you speak Mandarin, you're going to see the Mandarin script. Right. That is very important. If you don't speak English, you want to read that script in your own language. And at Through the Bible, we always try to encourage people to tell their friends and family about yes. the ministry and to listen to the broadcast. Well, if their native language, their heart mm-hmm. language is something other than English, TTB in my language dot com is a great place to refer them because chances are their language is going to be on that site. That's right. What I like to do, Steve, is we also have companion apps for Android and for iOS. Mm -hmm. And I like to pull out my app if I meet someone who speaks one of these 99 languages and I show it to them and and show them and they might be interested in hearing through the Bible in their language. Yeah, that's a great idea. Well, let's go ahead and read a couple letters as we always like to do. This first one is from Uzbekistan. And here's what this listener writes. I am from Uzbekistan, but I live and work in Moscow. The things that we experience here are unimaginable. Once a week, I hear people talking about me as one of those stupid immigrants from Central Asia. I have a university degree, but I'm still a nobody. I see the disdain in people's eyes. That's why it meant something when one of my neighbors, Igor, befriended me. It began as a simple hello in the morning, and then we began talking from time to time. There was something different about Igor. He seemed not to treat me as an Uzbek, but simply as a person. After several months, I learned that Igor was an evangelical Christian. We began talking about faith as well, and Igor told me about Through the Bible's broadcasts. After three months of listening, I can tell you that I've never experienced so much positive change in my life. I'm fascinated by the Bible, and I'm learning things that are changing my entire outlook on the world. Mm. Such a great story, and Steve, it ties into our digital ministry, because I can tell you our Uzbek broadcast is heard in Uzbekistan, but if you look at a map, Moscow is a long way away, and so this gentleman could not hear our radio broadcast, but he is going to hear it online uh, through listening to the Uzbek programs. Yeah. Now, here's a Bulgarian listener. Why don't you read that one? Yes. It says, for many years, I was running from God. I was angry at the people who hurt me. I was listening to bad advisors and was often in difficult situations. One day, God had my attention when a close relative gave me a Bible and asked me to go with her to church. I have dedicated my life to Christ and feel peace and joy. Your programs make knowing God easier. It's hard to read the Bible on my own, but with you as my guide, I understand it. Great. So many listeners around the world can say that. Regardless of the language. And he goes on to say, I have downloaded a lot of your messages and Mm -hmm. listened to them often May God bless you and use you greatly. So encouraging. And I'd invite you as a listener, if you haven't yet joined our world prayer team, so you can pray for people in Uzbekistan and Bulgaria, all around the world, do that today. ttb.org forward slash pray. Greg, why don't you pray for us as we begin? Father, thank you for the tools that you've put in our hand to get the whole 
word to the whole world. We're thankful that people can hear the program in so many different ways and so many different languages. We pray you'll reach many people through our efforts. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we come to a chapter that's quite a letdown after the last chapter, and yet has a tremendous message here for us. We saw that this man, Hezekiah, was the best king after David. None to compare to him. He is more like David than any other. And he's like David in some other ways. David didn't do so well as a father, and neither did Hezekiah. His son is the worst king that ever reigned over the southern kingdom. He's bad, friends. He's a real bad man. And we are given his story here, beginning with chapter 21. And it's actually a heartbreak when you read about the son of Hezekiah turning out as he did. I personally believe this. Now, I cannot confirm this. This is my own speculation and my own private opinion. And someone says that you're pretty dogmatic about some of your opinions. And I think that's true. If I thought it was another way, I'd be dogmatic about the other way. But I'm dogmatic about this way. I believe that the Shekinah glory, which Ezekiel was given the vision, left during the reign of Manasseh. Now, the Shekinah glory apparently was here at this time. And if the Shekinah glory didn't leave during the reign of Manasseh, I can't see anything that ever happened afterward that would cause the visible presence of God to leave. And during, uh, apparently, the reign of this man, the Shekinah presence of God left this temple, and it was a desolate temple, just as our Lord said in his day, that your house is left under you. Absolutely, it's a desolate place. It's forsaken of God. And I believe that happened during this time. Now, this fellow's a rascal. Let's look at him. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. Now, I pause to say this. God gave him ample opportunity, you see. He started in as just a 12-year-old boy. And it wasn't long. He was a teenager and in his early 20s. And somebody says he's young. He'll outgrow it. He didn't outgrow it. He got worse and worse and worse. But God gave him ample opportunity. You see, God is always patient, long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Now, notice here, and his mother's name was Hephzibah. And Hephzibah is the mother. But Hezekiah is the father. But the mother's name is always given. She will have to accept responsibility. She'll get the credit also. The name of Hezekiah's mother was given. Wonderful mother, apparently. Well, I don't know what Hephzibah did, but this boy is a rascal. Verse 2, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Now, he's as bad as any of the pagans that had been in that land when God put them out and put his people there. Well, he's not going to be there very long. That is, his people are not. They're going to have to leave. Verse 3, notice what he did. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. In other words, Hezekiah got rid of all of this. And I think it was a partial revival that took place during the reign of this man, Hezekiah. But now all of that comes to naught because he reared up altars for Baal. He made a grove, as did Ahab, king of Israel. Now you don't have many worse than Ahab, king of Israel. And he's compared now to him. And he worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served them. That means he worshiped the sun, moon, stars, and all of the hosts of heaven. Many of them, as you know, have names that pertain to the Greek gods. There was Apollo, there was Diana, and there were the others, by the way, so that he worshipped the host of heaven. But he says, my, we've come a long ways. No, we haven't. You can go into the five and ten cent store today, and you can get you a little packet there. It'll tell you what you're born and under, and 
Tell you all about yourself. There are a lot of people worshiping a host of heaven today. Verse 4, And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. Now, he defied Almighty God. He put altars in the very city. God says, Here's where I set my name, and I don't want any other of the heathen temples here. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, so that he actually not only put altars in the city, he put them right in the temple itself. Verse 6, he made his son pass through the fire. That was actually human sacrifice in that day, although it was to heat an image red hot and put a child, a baby, in it. And he either did that or else the child was offered to the heathen god without putting him in the red-hot idol. And he observed times. He used enchantments, and he dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. This is satanic. And he wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all Tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I have given their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. They're getting ready to travel. They don't know it, but they are getting ready to travel. They're going into Babylonian captivity. Because God says, I'll put you in that land, you'll not move any more, provided you obey me. Will you notice verse 9? But they hearken not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Now, not only was he as bad as the heathen, he was worse than the heathen. And I have news for him. They'll be leaving that land. God will not let them stay in that land. Verse 10, And the Lord spoke by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations, he hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing much evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. Just as God had judged both Ahab and Israel, God now is going to judge Jerusalem and Judah. Now listen to this. God says, And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. God says that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do some dishwashing. I'm going to take them. They're in my land. They're in my dish. God says, I'm going to wipe them right out of that land. Did you ever stop to think, whoever you are listening today, you may think that you're very clever, very sophisticated, and you don't need God. You're walking on his earth. It's his earth. You're breathing his air, by the way, and you're using his sunshine. And you're drinking his water, and he gave you the body that you got. <laughs> May I say to you, God says that every now and then I wash my dishes. When I do, I just wipe them out of the land. The nations down through the century lie along a highway of time, and they're in rubble and ruin. You know why? They did the same thing that we are doing today, living without God. We don't need him. God says, I'll wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish. And that's something very unusual. It looks to me like husbands dried the dishes in that day when the wives... But I don't want to start anything. I can assure you that, and I hope my wife's not listening. Now let me drop down. God says, I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance. I'll deliver them into the hand of their enemies. They shall become a prey and a spoil. To all their enemies. God says, I'm going to take my thumb or my finger out of the dike. The enemy is going to come in like a flood. Verse 16, Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much, 
You see, when a man goes into sin or a nation, they don't sin in just one respect. They sin in many respects. Now, we have not only forgotten God today, we've become an immoral nation. There's lawlessness. There's murder. Why, there are companies that are moving out of some of the great metropolis across this nation today to try to get away from the lawlessness. Well, you can't get away from it until this nation returns to God. That's the first step. Oh, you can have law and order. And I get so provoked today with some of these folk. They will turn the spotlight on communism. Well, why don't you turn the spotlight on God and say that's what we need today? We're offering nothing but a negative proposition. Let's get rid of communism. Let's get rid of lawlessness. How are you going to get rid of it, friend? You can't get rid of it. You have to turn to God. Now, this man is guilty of murder. And besides his sin, wherewith he made Judah to sin, and doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now we're told, now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and his sin that he sinned, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Manasseh slept with his fathers, buried in the garden of his own house in the garden of his... And Ammon his son reigned in his stead. Now, this is the story of this man. Not much to say other than he was evil and he was corrupt. Verse 19, Ammon was twenty and two years old when he began to reign. He reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Misha Lameth, the daughter of Heraz of Jotbah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh did. He's a bad one, too. And so we don't have much about him. Verse 23, the servants of Ammon conspired against them, slew the king in his own house. People of the land slew all them that conspired against King Ammon. Revolution, you see. That's what all of this leads to is revolution. We're today as a nation on the road to revolution. And it's unfortunate, but our leaders seem to be interested in only one thing, and that is to get elected. And it seems like some are actually willing to sell their own country in order to do that. We're living in dangerous days, friends. Now we're told this man, he was buried in the sepulchre in the garden of us also. And Josiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Now we come to the last of the great kings. And this man, Josiah, was a great king. Not only was he a great king, the greatest revival took place during the time of his reign. Well, you notice now, verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Notice how young these kings are? Why are they so young when they begin? Well, Papa got killed. God removed him. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedida, and she's the daughter of Adiah, of Boscath. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in all the way of David his father. And he turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. Now the sun's come up again. The light is shining again in the land. Now this man begins a movement that led to the greatest revival these people ever had after David and Solomon. Now, will you notice there's a sound here now of an abundance of rain. Verse 3, came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work, which is in the house of the Lord, to repair the breaches of the house. And I like this. The Lord's money was to be used for those that are doing something for him. My friend, when you find out that Today, any organization or any individual is not doing something for the Lord. I don't care who they are. They do not deserve our support at all. God says, let's turn this money over to the doers. Somebody's going to do something. Verse 6, under carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. 
I be it, there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand because they dealt faithfully. I tell you, there are certain churches today that are always issuing financial statements, and you can't even believe them. I tell you how they can patch them up and make them actually very deceitful. And they say, well, you know, figures don't lie. That's true, but liars really figure today. And we have here marvelous men. These men, they didn't have to give a report. They were faithful. They could be trusted. Now, the first thing they did was to repair the temple. And my friend, today, my feeling is that revival will begin, if it begins, among God's people. It has to begin there. And I see no evidence of it right at this moment. But this is the first step. And I'm going to talk next time a little about revivals, because we hear a great deal about that today. We're hearing it, but we're seeing nothing because we see no evidence of it. The thing that took place here was this man got rid of all of the idolatry that was in the city of Jerusalem. Idols had been put there by his grandfather, old Manasseh, the rascal that he was. And now they are removed, and God's house was in decay. You've got to begin building that. And the next step was this. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. You know, that's a terrible place to lose the Bible is in church, but that's where it's been lost today. How many churches in this land really rest upon the Word of God and preach it? Now, I thank God for the many letters that I get. And all over this land, there's still many faithful pastors We're trying to hold up their hands and help as best we possibly can. But my friend, how many did they have departed? They've lost the Bible in the church. And you remember, the parents of Jesus lost him at the temple. Believe me, Jesus is lost in church today, and the Bible is lost in church. Both of them have been lost today. And here, they find the Word of God. Where do they find it? Out on the dump heap? No. They find it in the temple. They lost it. And friends, the Bible has to be the beginning of revival. Now, I think it's wonderful that there's so many groups praying for revival. I wish they'd spend a little more time in the Word of God because it's a return to the Word of God that brings revival. Oh, how tremendous this is. Verse 9, And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house. They delivered into the hand of them that do the work and have the oversight of the house of God. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Why, they lost the word of God in that day. Verse 11, It came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he ran his clothes. It wasn't one of these nice little groups I hear about. Oh, we're going to have an evangelistic campaign. We're going to have a banquet and call in all the preachers. And we're going to talk sweet talk. And we're going to talk optimistically. And we're going to get everybody together. Oh, you are? My friend, what we need to do is to get together and hear the Word of God. And if we'll really hear the Word of God today, there'll be some rending of our clothes. We'll go down on our faces before him. I heard of a man. He's a wonderful Christian. He got up before a group of church officers, and he told them, he says, what this church needs is for this group of officers to get down on their faces before God and repent. You know what they did? They got rid of him. They didn't want him around. I want to tell you today, many so-called Bible churches... Many so-called fundamental churches, many so-called evangelistic meetings today are as far from the Bible as anything possibly can be. Oh, I tell you, if we really came to the Word of God, it would bring conviction. And you would hear weeping, and there'd be rending of clothes today. That's when you have revival. We're not seeing it in America today. Pray for our land, friends. We need prayer today. We don't need all these meetings that are taking place, and we always turn in a healthy report of the thousands. Oh, my friend, 
We need to get to the Word of God, and when we do, it'll have its effect. Well, I'm grateful you've joined us in God's Word today, and I pray that many more will join us in the future. In fact, why don't you invite a friend to join you tomorrow? You know, there's always room for one more on the Bible bus. To listen to today's message again, remember to visit ttb.org. And if we can help direct you to the right resource by Dr. McGee, just give us a call at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And when you call, please be sure to tell us how you listen to Through the Bible. Remember, this little bit of information makes a big difference as we make decisions and we really strive to be good stewards of the resources that God has so faithfully provided from listeners like you. Well, that's all for us today. I'm Steve Schwetz, grateful for your company today and every day as we make our way through the Bible. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.